Greetings and welcome to another study. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you all once again. And as can be seen from the title of the subject that we'll be looking at today is infectious diseases. Now, we should know that the time that we live in, it is the, the planet Earth is just filled with all types and manner of sicknesses and diseases. Uh, and as we get closer and closer to the end, we are going to see the situation become worse as time draws to a close. And so that's what we'll be looking at today. And I pray that at the end of the study, we will all have received the blessing. And we're going to read a prayer thought. And after the prayer thought, we're just going to progress with the subject matter and see what blessings the Lord has in store for us. Okay. Now I'm going to read a prayer thought from Timely Greetings, volume two, number 37, page 18. And it reads as follows. I'm reading Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse six, verse 12, and verse 15. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Wherefore, it shall come to pass, if he hearken to these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. So here the Lord was making it known that diseases were in Egypt. It seems there were quite a bit of disease. And the children of Israel had known about this, those the different types of diseases. And the Lord had promised that he was not going to put it upon them. And that's bearing if they were faithful. He was going to put it upon those that hate them. The comment. According to these verses, most of our diseases are caused through disobedience. And the very fact that there is so much disease in our time is evidence in itself that the world is reaping a full harvest for its disobedience. Hence, the longer we continue in our sins, the worse off will we be. Hence, the longer we continue in our sins, the worse off we will be. So as man becomes more disobedient, so diseases multiply. And as a result of disease multiplying, you find that scientists are constantly working to come up with medication to help to try to cure these various diseases. And as human beings continue in their sins, so the different diseases are multiplying. And not until there's a stop or an end to sin will there be an end to the various diseases that we have. So we're in a vicious cycle. Now let us pray. The great Father in heaven, as we come before your presence once again to study this subject, of infectious diseases. We pray that you'll bless us with your presence and that you'll teach us your words and that we'll walk with you in all humility and lowliness of mind and that we will learn to esteem each other better than ourselves. Bless us now and keep us and cause your face to shine upon us and grant us your peace. To Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, in continuing with the subject, we're going to turn to the book of Leviticus, 
chapter 13, and we're starting from verse 2. It reads as follows. When a man shall have in, his, in, his, in the skin of his flesh a raisin, a scab, or a bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then shall he brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priest. So this person is showing some sign of some plague, some sickness. They're not to take him to the doctor. That's not what it says. They take him to Aaron or to one of Aaron's sons, the priest. Verse three. And the priest shall look upon the plague in the skin of the flesh. And when the air in the plague is turned white and the plague inside be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy. And the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. If the bright spot be white in the skin of his flesh, in the sight be, and the sight be not deeper than the skin, and the hair thereof be not turned white, then the priest shall shut him up that at the plague seven days. It continues. And the priest shall look on him the seventh day. And behold, if the plague in his sight be at a stay, and the plague spread not in the skin, then the priest shall shut him up seven days more. This is considered a plague. Okay? Verse 6. And the priest shall look on him again, the seventh day, and behold, if the plague be somewhat dark, and the plague spread not in the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is but a scab, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. Now, we know that the children of Israel, while in Egypt, they were slaves, and it's not that any of them really, we read of, attended medical school or came out as doctors. So here we're told that whenever someone was sick, they would go to the priests and God directed those that were sick in, with this particular sickness to go to Aaron and his sons and the priest would, would determine if the person was well, had gotten better, or it was something that they needed to isolate themselves. It's just like, you know, a modern world, if, if there's someone with an infectious disease, they're inspect, expected to stay in, in their house for a period of time and, and self-isolate. Now, in this self-isolation period, after a seven-day time had lapsed, the priest would go back and look at this illness again, this plague, and see if the plague was stayed. Now, this plague more than likely could be infectious, you know. It could be an infectious plague. But the Lord had sent the priest would as to go and look at the situation. So the Lord's protective care would also be over the priest because not everyone would be allowed to go. The Lord specified who should be the ones to go. And so once the person was clean, the priest would pronounce the person clean or cured of whatever ailment they were suffering from. No. In volume two of the symbolic code, number five and six, page 12, inspiration says the following. Scrupulous cleansiness is essential to both physical and mental health. Not only cleansiness help you physically, you know, but mentally, just a clean environment does something for people's mind. And you know, when people are insane on the street, one of the signs of insanity you see these unclean, dirty people on the street, and, and it's a sign that something is not right. So scrupulous cleansiness is essential to both physical and mental health. Every form of uncleanness tends to disease. 
So if you are unclean, that's what breeds disease. No. Sometimes people who live in countries that are poor, they might go to the river and that's what they, they do. They wash their clothes there and they might take their bath there. That's where they bathe. And sometimes in the process, the children go there and play. And some people, they urinate in the water and they also defecate in the water. Now, someone else might be downstream and they don't realize that people are actually using the river like a toilet. They might catch the water and they use it. They might drink it or something and they get sick because of this unclean water that they drink. So uncleanness do tend to, to disease. And so every form of uncleanness tend to disease. Dead producing germs abound in dark, neglected corners, in decaying ref refuse, in dampness and mold and must. Nothing unclean or decaying should be tolerated within the home. Ministry of Healing, page 276. Scrub and scour all the corners in your home, closets, tubs, and pots. So now here we are told that our homes, our person must be kept clean. And some people, they might have a habit. They want to cough or sneeze and they sneeze in their hand and they leave and they go and they handle food or they touch the doorknob. Some people use the restroom. They go use the toilet and they don't wash their hands after. All these type of uncleanness are means for disease to spread. So people should practice scrupulous cleanness. It is very important. Now, we're going to be continuing. Now, in the modern era, unlike the days of Moses and Aaron, when someone suffered from leprosy, if we were going into someone's place with an infectious disease today, oftentimes people wear a mask. I mean, they wear a face mask to cover their face. And it is a way to protect them from catching something infectious. And that's what we see a lot of people wear in the modern era. Doctors and sometimes nurses and people who take care of the sick, they sometimes have their face covered, their, their nose and their mouth, not to take in any bad disease. And so, but people have freedom of choice. They can wear their mask or they cannot decide to wear their mask. It's optional. So no, diseases on the planet abound. All different types of diseases are on the land and they abound. No, we continue with inspiration. Sister White says in five manuscript release, page 24, paragraph one. Mary has been an apprentice in this office, but has not been well for some time. The blood is mostly in her head. Sarah MacEnterfor has been treating her for months. Fomentations, foot baths, sponge baths, rubbings, and so on. A physician was called to give her an examination. He says her case is a complicated one and she must leave the office. Her parents were afraid to have her come home because I had set before them the poisonous atmosphere in the house. So the house that she was from, that the sick person was gonna go back to had a poisonous atmosphere, whatever the condition of the home life was. The, the, in, the atmosphere in the home was not good and the parents were concerned for her coming back in the house, which they were inhaling all the time. I saw that the precious child would not get well here. So I finally proposed that Mary should go to America to the sanitarium. They consented to let her go. Now I wish you to tell me if this is not the best thing to be done, she's letting the parents know. 
The physicians here do not know how to take a case without drugging. So now they were applying a lot of drugs to try to get her better. They commended the way that she has been treated and recommended her to go to an institution in Basel under the care of the physician that attended Edith Andrews. The treatment is all given by men with masks on. So now mask is not something new. So whatever she was sick with, the people, the men or the physicians that were treating her, they all had on their mask because whatever they were concerned that she had, they were going to do their best to protect themselves from contracting her disease. It continued. Mary is a modest young woman and she would not go there, she said, if she died. What do you think of my sending her to the sanitarium? Question. She has had a hard time the past winter. Her feet cold as ice, room not properly heated. Her ankles swell very badly. She came down unable to do anything. I could not spare Sarah. She would work over her hours at a time. And I thought I would better be to the expense of her treatment at the sanitarium than have Sarah take care of her without conveniences, whatever. So now, at this particular place, this institution in Basel, the physicians there that had taken care of this Edith Andrews, treatment by these physicians were done by men in mask. And she, this young lady, did not want to go there. She did not want to go there. No, but what is interesting, however, is this. Whatever this young lady had, it was a mystery. It was very complicated. And so the doctors that were treating her, they in that time probably were not sure what was wrong with her. And they were just going to be cautious and not want to contract any sickness from her. Okay. So no. For those who wear a mask to protect themselves from catching, I mean, viruses or any ailments, sicknesses, some people, you know, as you see at the bottom section, they cover their mouth and they leave their nostrils out, their nostril. And some people don't wear the mask properly. And they're showing at the top how the mask should be worn to protect yourself properly from catching infectious diseases. And there are just a lot of different types of diseases on the planet. And we're told as we get closer to the end, the Lord, a matter of fact, there are seven last plagues to come. And if there are seven last plagues, it would indicate that there are plagues to come before the last ones. Those seven last plagues I've described in Revelation are the last set. So we know that we're going to have a lot of plagues before the seven last ones. So we should know that in the future, we might just see more people wearing masks as more disease comes upon the land. Okay, we continue. So we have various types of diseases and they're transmitted all different types of ways. We have sexually transmitted diseases, which is direct contact. We have airborne diseases like COVID and we have different kinds of ailment that transmit through the air. People can catch the cold or the flu. We have disease, people can sneeze in their hand or cough in their hands. You have all kinds of different ways. Indirect, you can touch a cup or something and people ingesting contaminated food, drinking contaminated water. You have insects that pass on disease. You have animals that pass on disease. So. It, it shows you that you can have an infected person that can infect a thing or an animal and then another person gets infected. You can inf get infected by shaking hands, by touching and opening a door. There's so many ways and so many diseases upon the land. 
they are plenty and numerous. And so, in continuing with the inspiration, it says, as a result of sin on earth, causing all creation to groan, Revelation, sorry, Romans 8, verse 22, the old solar family has suffered, the entire solar family, because we have scientists going out of, out of space, you know, and we on planet Earth don't have a clue what they're doing out there. But we're told here, through inspiration, track 9, page 27 to 28, that the entire solar system has suffered as a result of sin. The foregoing scriptures show that not only the earth, but also the heavens have waxed old under the curse of sin. That sin is a contagious disease with far-reaching results that whether one member suffer, all members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26. That God is to make an absolute riddance of sin and, and consequently that he will make void not only the earth, but also the entire solar system. And that while making the earth new, he will make new the solar system also. So no, not only do we have contagious diseases, sin, as highlighted in red, is also contagious. S-I-N, sin, is a contagious disease. So if you have literal disease, let's say COVID or other contagious diseases that are contagious, and people wear a mask and they wash their hands and they do other things to protect themselves, how do you protect yourself from the contagious nature of sin, which is a disease? So let's say someone is suffering from some bad sin disease. How do you see the, the disease? Now, anciently, Aaron would go and look on the person with a scab or had leprosy, and he could physically see the sin, the, the manifestation of this disease. He could see it. But this sin, the contagious disease of sin, that is unseen, how do you know how to protect yourself from it? When you see people passing you on the street, in church, at school, who is suffering then from a bad contagious disease of sin that they're looking to pass on to you? Because if someone has a sexual dis transmitted disease, they can infect someone else with it without the person knowing, especially if they don't look sick. Sin though, being contagious in nature, how do we protect ourselves from it? Being a contagious disease with far reaching results. No, the only thing we can do is to put on our mental, or mentally put on our mask and keep yourself protected from diseases and viruses. So no, if we don't want to be infected with people's sin disease, we have to have a mask over our mind, something insulating our brain, protecting our mind that this sin disease doesn't come in and affect us and take us over. So just like you have people in the hospital that have contagious diseases and physicians take precaution by putting on their suit and their mask not to get sick because the sick cannot take care of the sick, you know. It takes the healthy to treat the sick and it takes the healthy to help the sick get better. So if the physician gets sick, the physician is in no condition to take care of the sick. So the physician has to take cautionary measures in order 
to be able to help the sick. And so for us who are around diseases, which we know of, we might do our best to put on a mask. But in dealing with the disease of sin, we have to put on our mental or mentally put on our mask to protect ourselves. Now, we're going to look at this matter a little deeper as we progress. Inspiration says the following in volume two of the symbolic code, number 11, page two. Yet for the sake of the elect who had not bowed the knee to Baal, he turned with mercy because of the great danger of their also falling into the same inextricable pit unless they give careful heed to the clear ringing echoes of the solemn warning. But thou son of man, hear what I say unto thee. Be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house, unquote. And at the same time, avail themselves. So one thing, don't be rebellious. That's one. Listen. The second thing, and at the same time, avail themselves of the way of escape from the fatal disease of rebellion. This is a disease, you know. So now, for you not to catch this fatal disease of rebellion, you must have on your mask. You must have on your suit, your armor. This fatal disease of rebellion, Korah, Dathan, and Abiatar infected a lot of people in the days of Moses' wit. They infected the people and caused other people to catch the disease of rebellion. The people did not have on their mental mask. Mentally, they were not prepared to see that this is a disease that these people are trying to infect us with. They listened and they caught the disease. And they were thinking of stoning Moses. They were thinking of stoning Caleb and Joshua. They said Moses took too much on, upon himself and they rebelled and they rebelled and they rebelled and they could not be cured of the disease. So much so, the only two persons that were able to go in the promised land that were older than 20 were Caleb and Joshua. Almost all the rest got the disease. And they said, would to God that we had died in the wilderness. And they did die in the wilderness. So inspiration is telling us that one, we must try not to be rebellious. And he says, if you catch that disease, you're in trouble. And he continued, escape from the fatal disease of rebellion, which divine mercy has provided, in hating the hope, given life-sustaining words, open thy mouth and eat that I give thee, and feed thy people with thy rod. You see the mask? The Lord has sent the rod as the face mask. And no person who put on this mask, the truth, should find himself in rebellion, catching that disease. But listen, the enemy is walking around with his sick agents trying to infect people every day. And a lot of people are catching the disease. So as we have physical disease that are plaguing the land because of people's disobedience, spiritual diseases are also multiplying because when a person is rebellious and they catch physical diseases, their rebellion caused them to catch these diseases a lot of time, I mean, upon the planet Earth. And so as a cause of catching these diseases, a lot of time they're also spiritually rebellious. They're not listening to God. They want to do what they want to do. I'm not saying if someone gets sick, it's because they're rebellious. Because the old creation grown it and travail it in sin right up to this day. Paul was sick too. 
You understand? He said the Lord had given him a thorn in the flesh. While that might not have been a disease, he, was, he had some form of sickness. So God, people can get sick. So now, the things that we're talking about, though, is these transmittable spiritual diseases, which are more dangerous than physical disease. Because you know what? You can't see the spiritual disease. If someone has COVID or some other contagious disease, malaria or some of these other sicknesses, you can tell because the person gets physically sick. But what if they're corrupt and evil and deceptive and crafty, like the men who wanted to put Daniel to death, who went to the king in craft? Those diseases you can't see with your eyes. But you have to take keen discernment to detect it. Now we continue with inspiration. There has ever been a class among God's people who make it their business to question and to criticize everything in the unfolding of truth. They say, we accept this and that, but we will not accept the other. They think it a mark of intelligence to question and to criticize. But this proud and self-esteeming class among church members who think they are so wise and so capable of judging even the message which they have really, which they have already acknowledged that God has sent them, have always met the displeasure of the Lord. And he has demonstrated to men that their so-called wisdom is nothing short of foolishness. They are so foolish that even though their case has been presented to them in the experience of others for thousands of years, they cannot discern their evil and soul-destroying course. So all these same mistakes that people are making for thousands of years, these things are documented in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy, and people are still making the same mistake. These self-appointed judges of the messages that God sends to his people have, by their doubts and criticism, scattered away from Christ many weak souls who are subject to being affected with the disease whenever they are exposed to it. Now listen, these are young people in the message, you know. They come and these older sick ones infect them with some infectious disease. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, because he have trust with, the, with side and with shoulder and push all the disease with your horns till ye have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock and they shall no more be a prey and I will judge between cattle and cattle. Now, if you have a person who is sick spiritually with disease and they infect someone else with the disease, the doctor, the physician, the person who is going to go to try to help these people must make sure that their mental mass is on. Because when you go to a lot of these people, instead of dealing with their problem, they start to criticize someone else. The reason why I had to talk up is because so-and-so did so-and-so to me. Do you know that he was doing this and that? And sometimes they're talking about things that you don't even know about. And if you start to listen and sympathize with them, you catch a disease. You went disease free. And when they're finished talking to you, they want to infect you with the same disease. But the Lord says, judge not that ye be not judged. We don't go to deal with sick people to get their sickness, we go to cure disease. So if you go to deal with someone that has these kind of spiritual diseases and you see that they do not want to get help, then you have to leave them alone. You have to leave them alone. 
because their sole objective is to go around and infect other people. That's what they are about. Just the same way of physical diseases is transmit, transmitted from human beings to human beings and to animals also, these sick people are trying to infect other people. And so, inspiration says, souls are subject to being affected with disease whenever they are exposed to it. So if you're exposed to disease, and listen, people who work in labs who handle infectious disease, they have to make sure that they have on their masks and their gowns, you know, because if they catch those disease that they handle, they're going to be in serious trouble. A lot of precaution has to be taken that they don't spread these type of disease to other people. But while we take precaution by wearing masks for these physical disease that's in, in our environment, we don't wear our spiritual protection, our spiritual, our mental mask. We just expose ourselves to any and everything. We don't take the necessary precaution, not realizing that we're dealing with the devil. And we have to have on our spiritual, discerning, mental mask. We continue. Inspiration. The efficiency of the nurse depends to a great degree. If a nurse is going to be efficient, it depends to a great degree upon physical vigor. The better the health, the better will she be able to endure the strain of attendance upon the sick. And the more successfully can she perform her duties. Those who care for the sick should give special attention to diet, cleanliness, fresh air, and exercise. This is physically, you know. So if you're going to enter to deal with the sick, the spiritual sick, you will have to make sure you're eating good spiritual food. The food that you're eating and the environment that you're in, the spiritual environment must be one that is clean. You have to make sure that wherever you are, which church you belong to, which association you're a part of, you have to make sure that the environment is clean, fresh air, fresh, clean air. The Holy Spirit in the spiritual sense must have access to breed upon the people and exercise missionary work. So whatever transpires in the physical is also applicable in the spiritual. And it continues, let carefulness on the part of the family will enable them also to endure the extra burdens brought upon them and will help to prevent them from contracting diseases. So the family too, you know, not only the nurse, not only those who are sick, but also the family. So now in the spiritual sense, even the family have to be reasoning together, looking out for each other, that no member in the family catch these spiritual diseases, just as it is in the physical. It continues, nurses and all who have to do with the sick room should be careful, calm, and self-possessed. Nurses and all who have to do with the sick room should be cheerful, calm and self-possessed. They cannot be swayed. They must be cautious. And those who deal with the, phys the spiritually sick has to be the same. They have to be cheerful. They have to be calm. And they have to be self-possessed. Because spiritual disease is worse than physical disease. All hurry, excitement, or confusion should be avoided. All hurry, excitement, and confusion, and the same thing that applies in the physical applies in the spiritual. So, if you are going about your business and someone has depicted there in the red circle as a bad infectious disease and is walking on the street, you can't tell that the person is sick. 
they look healthy and they're going about their normal business. But how then if the person was spiritually sick, which is worse? And you go to church with them, you eat with them, you talk with them. You have to know if the person is sick. No. Listen what Proverbs chapter 4, verse 14 to 16 has to say. Enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief. And their sleep is taken away unless they cause some to fall. Spiritual disease. And they are searching for people to carry to hell with them. And you must have on your spiritual mask in this spiritual warfare with spiritual diseases blowing all over the place. I hope we're clear so far. We're moving on. Inspiration says, it diagnosed my case. Now I know there is hope for me. What is the it that diagnosed the case? This person is going to admit that they were sick. And in being sick, a physician, a spiritual physician, a student of the, the, the word, a minister came to fix the problem. I thank my precious savior that he's showing me my legacy and condition, wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked and deplorable condition. I realize my soul is afflicted with a fatal disease. So now the disease that this person is admitted, admitting that they have is fatal. They would die, they would be lost, and the situation would be hopeless. And that only he who was born into this world to save his people from their sins can with my yielding, this sick person with their own yielding, holy to him, Make me clean. All right, how is this going to be done? When this message found me, this message, I was, no, I was longing for something, but knew not what it was. But how oh, I thank the Lord for the message of the true witness who speaks to my soul through the Esrod or the Shepherd Rod message. So the Shepherd Rod message is the antidote to heal the person. Now the person yielded and knew that they had a fatal sickness, a fatal disease. And they wanted some minister, some soul, some Bible teacher to come and administer the cure. Now when you go to administer the cure, the person might be talking all kind of thing. They might want to infect you with their disease too. And you just listen, I'm not really here about that to listen who, who bothered you, who is sleeping with who, who don't like who. We're here with different matter. We're here to cure, to fix disease. So now when you're listening to all negativity, it can affect you. So you went to cure a disease and you got a disease. So now those who are teachers of the message that go with a purpose, they have no time to get in tidbits of gossip and tail and tattletale stories and people trying to put down someone else to exalt themselves. They go with the cure. They have on their spiritual mask and they're administering the solution to the problem. And the sick will say, as the reading says, now I shall never be satisfied until I love the Lord with all my heart and soul, body and strength and my neighbor as myself. Here is a person that has been healed and they can go out and help others now. And so we are moving on. So sometimes you're going in some building and you might see face masks required beyond this point. You might be going through a door or sometimes you might see a place danger inside and they're indicating on the sign notice. 
put on your face mask. An inspiration says, I, for one, cannot overlook, neglect, or reject the Lord's counsel in this matter. I must hear the rod and him who has appointed it if I expect to have a home in his kingdom. I cannot afford to do otherwise, God helping me. For he himself declares that if I would know how to come before him, what offering is acceptable to him, and how to do justly, how to love mercy and how to walk humbly before him. I must hear the rod that crieth unto the city. So no, the rod that crieth unto the city is the only remedy for the problems that we are faced with as humanity. No. So if someone is plagued with a spiritual sickness and you bring the message to them to heal them and they have no desire to hear it, you cannot keep exposing yourself to these people. Because they're going to try to infect you with their Laodiceanism. Or if people say they believe the message, but they're living contrary to it, they're bad talking their brethren, they're talking on the truth, you know that you have to be careful of these people because they're subtly trying to infect you with a disease, and you must be able to see it. As you can see, physical sickness. You have to be able to discern it. And once you discern the character of people, make sure you mentally are protected with your mask. So no, you have to mentally social distance yourself. And it's called mentally social distancing yourself. And so... Some people will say to you, don't be stupid. You need to listen to me. Don't you know Mary is this and this one did that? And you just tell them, stay away from me with your poison doctrines. I don't want to hear it. And so social distancing, while it applies in the physical realm, also is applicable in the spiritual. When people are negative, but biting, cutting down, have false doctrine, you have to have on your mask and you have to tell these people, listen, I do not hate you, but you have to stay away with that kind of stuff, that negativity. I don't want to hear it. Here is the rod. It is here to cure you. And if you don't want it, I cannot keep in your company. It's just too negative. And this is what Solomon had said, enter not in the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it. Pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. That is their objective. And you have to be able to have courage to act, to say politely but firmly, your conversations are not leading me even ward. They want to infect me. I don't even know anything about that person you're talking so bad about. Why are you telling me these things about the person? And especially if you know the person, even if what you're saying about the person is true, suppose a person has repented. Give them a chance. Pray for them. You bring some balm to heal them. So, folks, we have a multiplicity of diseases. So people have all kinds of problems they're trying to infect people with. No. Inspiration says the following. Mind, character, and personality. Sister White says the following. This explains it all. They feel that they are rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. While heaven pronounces them poor, miserable, blind, and naked. To these, the true witness says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salves, that thou mayest see. Revelation 3, verse 17 and 18. Your very self-complacency shows you to be in need of 
everything. You are spiritually sick and need Jesus as your physician. Now this laodicea and condition, you know, inspiration says it's a spiritual sickness. Do you know how many people get baptized in crusade or attend Bible studies and they come in the church on fire and in a few months they catch a sickness. They're dead, totally dead and their spirituality is gone. They have become infected with the spiritual sickness. And if they come in the church on fire, studying, reading, praying, consecrating themselves to God, some of the holy members, some of the older members will say, Why are you studying your Bible so much? You're always praying and meditating and thinking, oh, you can reach a soul for Christ. Take your time, have some fun. You're so young. Why are you so serious about God? Wait until you get older. You know what they're trying to do? Infect you with your sick spiritual sickness. And if you don't have on your mask, mentally protecting yourself, you will catch the disease. You do not want to catch it. Sometimes too, they will come to you with gossip, with all manner of things, one test after another to try to infect you with the same bad plague of sickness. And inspiration says the people in this Laodicean condition, it's a spiritual sickness, just as cancer or diabetes or syphilis or any HIV, which are physical sickness, this spiritual sickness is worse because people can be physically sick, but spiritually sound. But when you're spiritually sick and physically sound, you are dangerous because you appear sound and sad and sober, but you become the more deceptive. And inspiration says, diseased minds, diseased minds have a disease and sickly experience. You see this diseased mind, they want to pass on the same sickness to other minds, you know. So you have to be mentally protected and have on your mental mask. And you have to social distance yourself from these type of people. And inspiration says, while a healthy, pure, sound mind with the intellectual faculties unclouded will have a sound experience, which will be of inestimable worth, the happiness attending a life of well-doing will be a daily reward and will of itself be health and joy. So you have two different types of people. One that's healthy, pure, and sound. This is a mind, you know. And the next one that have a diseased mind. The healthy mind is trying to affect someone else to have healthy mind. The diseased minds are trying to infect people with the same disease, sickly experience. And when they talk about their experience, it's just a sickly experience. Oh, you know, John, he wasn't nice to me at church. Oh, I don't like the food he cook or this or that, or I don't believe in this doctrine and I believe in this, but I don't want that. And they're trying to tell other people what to think and how to infect them. And once they see consistently that you have on your mental mask, they will leave you alone because they see that you're not that type of person. And inspiration is warning us Diseased minds have a disease and sickly experience. And you know what these sick people are essentially saying? And if you see this man trying to have somebody's mind in his hand, their brain to affect, and they talk with these wicked people as they sit and talk to you, let me see how I can take my sin disease and then infect the mind in my hand. And next, get it, this infected person, you know, to become sickly, diseased, and unbalanced like myself to infect others. And you know what? Sometimes he's a father. He infects his children. And they go out with the same temperament. They go to school and they go look to infect other people. Some of these parents, they watch all, all kind of evil on their, in their homes. 
The children see it. They talk anything. And the children go home, not thinking what the evil they have done to their children, but the children go out and infect other children. And so people are always trying to mess with somebody else's brain. So much so the Lord warned us, if it was possible, even the very elect would have been deceived. Because we are more precautious with physical sickness than we are with spiritual sickness. We will know people are spiritually sick. We talk to them on the phone, we're friendly with them. And we say to ourselves, well, I don't really listen or take up what he's saying, you know. I hear what he's saying, but I don't really pay him any mind. But you don't know. The bad talk, the negativity, slowly is like droplets of water on a stone, you know. After a while, it leaves its imprint. And so inspiration says, Sister White, 16 manuscript release. Reports have come to Elder Butler that were not correct or true. Those reporting were those plural people, those reporting were deceived by the enemy and were in their turn deceiving him, putting a wrong interpretation upon many things. This is interpretation knowing. Of. So you have all kinds of spiritual disease. In his weak condition of health, he accepted everything as verity and truth and acted accordingly. No, they could come to me with anything about health reform, dress reform, anything they could have come. And they confused this mind, this person's mind. He solicited no interview with me. Sister White is saying she was there, you know, and she could have helped him. But he solicited no interview with me and did not come to call upon me, although several times he passed almost by the door where I was rooming. He did not ask me if the statements brought to him were true, but accepted all that had been unwisely told him. Have those who made these impressions upon his sick mind. You see this? He could have gone to Sister White. She's saying he's there. And his mind was already sick already. And they deceived him with wrong interpretation. That's what inspiration says right here. Wrong interpretation. They gave him wrong interpretation upon many things. No, when his mind became sick, what is he going to do with those interpretations? He's going to teach it to other people. That's what he's going to do. And she's saying he has a sick mind and the people are teaching him. They deceived him. They were sick too. She said, those who have made these impression upon his sick mind, been as zealous to remove them as they were to make them, let them answer this to God, for they must be met in the judgment and answer to their. See, see, it's not only people coming with gossip and all these things. This is false doctrine. The disease, the infectious disease of false doctrine. And if we don't study, eat the spiritual food, the rod, fortify ourselves, we too can be deceived because inspiration says they were deceived by the enemy. So this is Satan working through people to deceive other people. So this is why we have to make sure the very elect must be able to have on their mental mask, spiritually protected, and tell deceivers, listen, you see all of that stuff that you're coming up with? Those things are not the truth. They're not in the golden bowl. And people can take statements from the golden bowl and try to interpret them in their own way. You don't want that. So no, when you see a deceiver, no deceiver is innocent, you know. No, no. A matter of fact, a deceiver 
is worse than cancer, worse than AIDS, and worse than the most dangerous disease upon planet Earth. Because if you catch a disease, a physical disease, the Lord can still save you. If spiritually you're sound, you accept him, you follow his truth, and you love the Lord. But if you accept a spiritual disease and you become infected by it, you cannot be saved. And that's why spiritual disease is worse. But we are more cautious with physical diseases. If people are traveling to a certain place and they know that there's yellow fever or hepatitis, or they know that they're coronavirus or some other virus, people are in an antsy and they take their, their, their precaution. They put on their mask. And sometimes if they hear that someone has coronavirus, they might make sure they keep their social distance from them. But if someone has false doctrine, if they are biting, if they are terrible, you know what? Nobody stays far from them. They sit and talk to them and they listen to them and they're not telling them the truth. They don't want to reprove. But inspiration continues. The enemy, says the spirit of truth, is preparing for his last campaign against the church. He has so concealed himself from view that many can hardly believe that he exists, much less can they be convinced of his amazing activity and power. They have to a great extent forgotten his past record, and when he makes another advanced move, they will not recognize him as their enemy, that old serpent, but they will consider him a friend, one who is doing a good work, Boasting of their independence. You see, this is one of the things, though, you know, people have disease, you know. When you hear people say they are independent, they belong nowhere. They're with no one, no association, nothing. They're just floating around trying to do their own thing. You know that this person has some bad disease. Boasting of their independence, they will, under the specious bewitching influence, obey the worst impulses of the human heart, and yet believe that God is leading them. Could their eyes be open to distinguish their captain? They would see that they are not serving God, but the enemy of all righteousness. They would see that their boasted independence is one of the heaviest fetters or chains that Satan can rivet upon unbalanced minds. No, folks, if we think physical diseases and plagues are bad, spiritual disease and plagues are worse. And this is one of the things that the Lord is saying. When you see these independent people running off on their own, looking at following, you know that Satan has gotten them and they're looking for someone to infect. Put on your mask and keep social distancing. And so you tell people, brother or sister, you have some disease. You need cure. And not until you get cured will I talk to you. No, anciently, the Lord told Aaron and the priests, lock them away for seven days. So you put them away for a while. Now you can check back on them and see if they're willing to change their they're, they're mine if the Lord has helped them. If they're coming up with the same foolishness, you lock them away again for seven days. And I'm saying this seven days is not a literal seven days. It means you're giving them time, space. And if they cannot be cured of this unclean sickness that they have, keep your social distance from them. And know that this spiritual disease of independence, once it bites them, it's difficult for them to be cured. And inspiration says, Sister White, the mind which is allowed to be absorbed in story reading is being ruined. The practice results in an air castle building and a sickly sentimentalism. The imagination becomes diseased. 
And some people are caught up in these love story novels. Now, in Sister White's days, it was the books, you know. Now it's the movies. Today, it's the, the people who are the trendsetters people are watching. And you have all these people are opening up on the TV, showing their life. And on the internet, trendsetters, reality TV, where people are, and people watch these things and want to be like them. And so after a while, people's imagination become disease. People want to have cars like them, house like them, live like them, dress like them. And guess what? Sometimes wives in a home have this disease that they've caught from these people and they're trying to tell their husbands that they must give them this life. People are borrowing money all over the place to try to live the life, to keep up with the Joneses. The Joneses gave them a disease and they're trying to pass the disease on to someone else. Put on your face mask, your protective care and say, I will not catch your disease. And inspiration continue. There's a vague unrest, a strange appetite for unwholesomeness, mental food. You see this, this is meant, they want bad food, an wholesome mental food. So you have proper spiritual food and you have bad food. Thousands are today in insane asylums whose minds became unbalanced by novel reading. No, it's not only novel reading. That was novel reading then. Many people are losing their sanity because they cannot live the life they see depicted by movie stars. They feel like they're a failure. They're looking at illusion and want to be like what they see. They want to be like the singers and the actors. And inspiration says, the memory is greatly injured by ill-chosen reading which has a tendency to unbalance the reason powers and to create nervousness, weariness of the brain and prostration of the entire system. Put on your mental mass when you're dealing with people like this because they will try to infect you. And sometimes families are broken apart because of the un unreasonable demands that are brought into home. And it's a disease in the mind. So know what you do? And some people will say to you, these independent false interpreters, false teachers, preachers, all kinds of stuff. You fool. Don't you know that I am a messenger of God? They want you to take the message, you know. They want to force it on you. But you have to be firm to act. Faith, courage, and action. This is where we have to act as a sound people. Stay away from me with your poison doctrines. Social distancing. An inspiration in Job 15 verse 5 says, For thy mouth uttereth iniquity, and thou choosest the tongue of the crafty. An inspiration says in the desire of ages, they were, not in, they were interested in Jesus from selfish motives. That is the crowd who were following for fish and bread. They hope to receive some special benefit to his power, and they stake their faith on the granting of this temporal favor. But they were ignorant as to their spiritual disease, and they saw not their need of divine grace. And this is one of the worst things. They have a spiritual disease. They don't see their need of change. And they're trying to infect other people with the disease. And this is a bad, bad condition for anyone to be in. And so brothers and sisters, we have to make sure that we're eating the rod and that we have on our spiritual mass. And it's going to take more than that too. So, and in Proverbs 21 verse 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination, how much more, how much more abomination, you know, when he bringeth it with a wicked mind. So now they can never be with you at studies in the church. And they say that they've made sacrifice and they're bringing it tied. But they're bringing it with a wicked mind. 
And then some of these same people turn around to infect you. How, what are they doing with the tide? Why is it the money have to be spent on this? And why is it this have to be done? And why is it that have to be done? You know why these people are doing these things though? They are doing it to infect you because they can, if they have a genuine concern, go talk to the ones in authority. What complaining to you is, how complaining to you is going to help the situation. So you see, wickedness abound. And if we are not guarded with our shield and our mass, we will become infected. And once the devil infects you, he's trying to get the disease to spread throughout your entire system and you go infect someone else. And this is why inspiration says, the wise will not let the enemies of truth fool them. The wise will not let the enemies of truth fool them. They protect their mind. They're guarded. And inspiration says, 1 Corinthians, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. It states the following. Examine yourselves, where they be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, or that Jesus Christ is in you, except he be reprobates? We have to know who we are, unless you're a reprobate. And we have to know when people come to us to discern what kind of spirit is in this person. Why is this person so negative? They're always talking bad about someone else. You have to analyze people's spirit, you know. See what's going on, what they talk about. Someone writes you a letter. Is it this letter is uplifting, unifying? This person, when they post on, 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 on the social media, they post always subtly trying to undermine someone else. It is not unifying or uplifting. It's always trying to tell people to go off, to break away or to cut down someone. You see the disease. Discern it and put on your mask and talk to them. Try to give them help. And if after a time, as Aaron had shut away the sick for seven days, Put them away and go back if you've given them something and said, did you get a chance to look at what I gave you? They might say, no, I'm not looking at that. That's foolishness. Well, they say, listen, you have taken your position and I have to respect you for your choice. And this is my position. Position. As from henceforth, we will spend no time wasting on these things that you believe. And what I believe, I believe. If you hold your point, and this is I'm talking, you know, if you know the person has error and they've been shown they have error, are they going off in some independence to drag people off of them? You know to put on your mask. And it says, God is raising up men to go forth to labor in the harvest field. And if they are humble, devoted, and godly, they will take the crowns which those ministers lose who concerning the faith are reprobate. So you see this? Some who had the crown, they lost it and became reprobate. And so how they lost it, they were ministers, you know. It means they lost their fellowship certificate. They don't have it. This is why inspiration says, when people come to teach, you can ask them, do you have your fellowship certificate? No. Where do you belong? Where are you from? What are you teaching? Who authorized you to teach? I'm from nowhere. I'm with no one. I'm just doing my own thing. You have to just fix your mass. Fix your mass. Because the Lord says, where two or three are gathered, touching anything in my name, this person is gone off by themselves. What are they doing? Fix your mass. And so protect yourself from those of wicked mind. Protect yourself from those with wicked mind. And so if we hear that there's some nuclear attack or there's a poisonous gas in our environment or in our area and we had mass, we would put it on because we want to stay alive. But we talk all the time to the wicked. 
we listen to them, we laugh with them, we engage them, we're back and forth with them. But what are they trying to do? They're trying to affect our mind. So we are more concerned about our physical being and not our spiritual being. We are not like Christ, you know, to say, get the ends behind me, Satan. We sit down and talk to him, laugh and have fun. And so we are told we have to mentally discipline ourselves, you know. Now, you have some people, they come, they don't believe in the Holy Spirit. There's no Holy Spirit. We don't want to hear nothing about the Holy Spirit. No Holy Spirit exists. And the Bible says Jesus Christ was led of the wilderness, in the wilderness of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God descended like cloven tongues of fire upon the disciples in the upper room. This, and some of these people, they talk bad against the Holy Spirit. Guess what? Put on your mask. Put on your spiritual mask. Social distance. Another set, you must keep Jewish feasts now. Passover. Feast of Tabernacles. New Moon. All these things. And you must follow Jewish laws. You cannot shave your beard. Women must wear only linen. And on and on and on. And so these people are pushing their stuff. And people sit down and listen and suck it up. And they are unstable minds. They're mentally ill. And they say, go and say, I am the anointed special one. But the apostle Paul says in Romans 16, 17, now I beseech you. Paul says, as for I, I know what I'm about, you know, but I'm beseeching you. I, Paul, know what I'm about. Because Paul had contended with some of these same people who was pushing that the Gentiles should be circumcised and keep Jewish feasts. And Paul says, and the apostles had a big contention with them. And so Paul says, no, I beseech you, brethren, mark them. You know, the Bible says we must mark them. You know, you, let's say you're, you are marking some things. So you mark my one on it, and this is number two, but you put a mark on it. So this is not a physical mark you're putting on the person, you know. Mentally, you've lined up your board. It's like you have a board in your mind, a mental board. And on the mental board, you have a mark. You might say, this per person, you have their name. I am marking them as a dangerous person false doctrine person they teach false doctrine so when you put a mark upon them in your mind you put on your mask when you're dealing with them and you know so once you see them subtly trying to steer the conversation in a certain way or if they come to your studies and they're trying to subtly take the studies to infect other minds with their falseness the bible says mark them which cause divisions this is where it's going you know and offenses contrary to the doctrine which we have learned and avoid them, social distance. Sometimes too, you have to tell these people to stop attending the studies because they're mentally ill and they're trying to infect somebody with their disease. And because we're in a spiritual warfare, you have a next set, you have to mentally distance yourself from. Some now are teaching that the Holy Spirit is a female. So you have the father and the son and the Holy Spirit is a female. And people are believing these things and they come to infect people. And another set is saying there is no Trinity. Don't tell me about the third person of the Godhead. We hate the Holy Trinity. And although inspiration says there are three persons of the Godhead, they say we don't want to hear nothing about that. And they are looking to infect people. And so we have to have on our spiritual mask to protect us from so much and be eating good spiritual food. Because when you're dealing with these people, you have to be fortified and protected, knowing the right message. Because some of these people are using the Bible and the spirit of prophecy to twist up the conversation with their own interpretation. Or they will go and say the pioneers say, the pioneers say, to avoid the spirit of prophecy. 
And the object is for Satan to deceive souls, to put them right in the casket, to carry them to hell with him. This is why Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13 says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it's a cycle, you know. They're deceiving and they're getting deceived. And they're studying error and they're feeding error. And they're studying error and they're feeding error. And so you have to social distance yourself from these people. Mentally social distance yourself. And so as you see this elderly person with this young man trying to talk to him and the person is saying, you're trying to restrict my freedom with the spirit of prophecy. I must have unrestricted pleasure and sin now. And guess what? That young man, he's going to infect some other young people right in the church. Another set in the church says the Bible alone. I do not need the spirit of prophecy. Throw it in the garbage. And they are looking to infect someone else. You have the independent. Independent of any association. Saying I am rich and increase with goods. And have need of nothing. I am on my own. Doing my own thing. And I will carry anyone astray. Who I can influence. This is, this is a typical Laodicean. Evil while professing to be a Davidian. And it says, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And so, as we get closer and closer to the end, things are going to become worse and worse. And so, we will have to have on our mental mass, social distancing on ourselves, from false people, put them in a room, a mental room, isolate them. And as the Aaron used to do anciently, you put them away. And after seven days, not a literal seven days, and you say, I will talk to you next time. And so, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 says, For such are false apostles. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And so you have another said, no, I am the Lord's servant. I am Elijah. That's antitypical Elijah, you know. And I am antitypical David. I will be the king. And the next set over the other side said, you are a wicked liar. It is me who is antitypical Elijah. And, and, and antitypical David or Elijah and David. It is me who will be the king. I am the Lord's servant, not you. But listen, God's people must not allow these false, evil, demonic people. They're demon possessed people. They are demon possessed people looking to infect and capture someone else. And if people do not have on their mental, spiritual mass, fortify with the message of present truth, the rod, and understand it, they will be deceived. And inspiration continues. This is Life Sketches. And Sister White gives an experience in Life Sketches. She says the following. And listen how dangerous people are. In New Hampshire, and this is what she's going to give an experience. In New Hampshire, we had to contend with a species of spiritual magnetism. This is spiritual, you know, of a similar character with mesmerism. It was, the, it was our first experience of this kind and happened thus. So Sister White is going to tell of an experience she had. Arriving at Claremont, we were told that there were two parties of Adventists. One party denying the, the their form of faith and another small number who believed that in their past experience, they had been led by the providence of God. We were directed to two men, especially as old in view similar to our own. We found that there was much prejudice against these men, but suppose that they were persecuted for righteousness' sake. We called on them and were kindly received and courteously treated. We soon learned that they claim perfect sanctification 
declaring that they were above the possibility of sin. No, once you hear that people talking like that, you have to fix your mask, you know, and you have to make sure that you're fortified. That's what they were saying. No, she continues. A sister of one of these men requested a private interview with me. So one of the sisters, a sister of one of these men, wanted to talk to Sister White privately. She had much to say concerning, and concerning entire consecration to God and endeavor to draw out my views in regard to this subject. While talking, she held my hand in hers and with the other hand, and with the other, sorry, softly stroked my hair. So no, Sister White is just talking to this lady. You know? So she reached out one hand and she took Sister White's hand. So, you know, she's close to her. She, so let's say she took Sister White's hand and she's holding one of Sister White's hand in her hand and she's talking to her. She reached across her had her hand and she started to stroke her hair, playing in her hair, stroking. No, she said, I prayed. Sister White says, I prayed that angels of God might protect me from the unholy influences. No, this is not no holy influence, you know. It says it's unholy influences, which this attractive young woman was seeking to exercise over me with her fair speeches and gentle caresses. No. We don't need it to go in a lot of details to see what this woman was trying. And Sister White says she was attractive and she was trying to put some spell on her. No, let's say this was not Sister White, but just some regular young girl at church who did not know how to pray, who did not know God, who did not know that these people are hypnotists. Let's say this young girl was in their home and nobody knew what was happening. What would have happened to this young child? And these people are professing church people. You know what would happen to the child? She could not resist these people. And Sister White says she had much to say in regard to spiritual attainments and great fate of her brother. Her mind seemed to be very much occupied with him. And this and his experience, I felt that I must be guarded in what I said and was glad when the interview was ended. This is Sister White, you know. These people are demon possessed and they're living all kinds of unholy life. No, if we don't have on our mass, if we're not fortified and protected, the Lord said, it, if it was possible, even the very elect would have been trapped. And so, we have to protect ourselves. It's a spiritual warfare. And mentally, the war is over our mind. That is where we serve God. That's where we make decisions. That is the seat of intellect. And so, we are living in a serious time. And inspiration says the following. Timely greetings. Number five, page 20. There is a certain element. And Brother Houtif described it as being element. There is a certain element. Whom even God himself cannot convince that he's taking the reins in his own hands. You hear this? God, you know, cannot convince them. You have to permanently social distance yourself from these people. They never take orders from anyone but themselves. Such independent ones will continue to question and criticize everything in which they themselves have no part. So regardless of, of their profession, of what they think or say, they are not God's people. How are we going to see through this statement and see these independent people, they don't take advice, they don't listen. It's like you're talking to someone and you're advising them, you're reasoning with them, you're counseling with them and they're not listening. What are you gonna continue doing? You have to put on the old armor and even when your mind is masked up that no one can see, 
outside too. You have to have on the blessed plate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the feet protected by the gospel, the sword of the spirit, the belt of absolute truth, the helmet of salvation. Sister White was God's prophetess, you know, his servant. And that woman was trying to put upon her an only influence. You know. It was nothing only. We would call it seduction. And this was not a man. Sister White is a woman. And that is a woman. So we don't know a lot of times when a lot of young people get sucked into things. They're at the wrong place, at the wrong time, and with the wrong people. And they were not fortified in their mind. And this is why Solomon said, don't even go in their house. No. It says, when a man shall have his skin of his flesh, a rising scab of bright spot, and it be, this is Leviticus 13, you know, in the skin of his flesh, the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest or unto one of the sons of the priest. So now, when you read Leviticus chapter 13, from verse 2 to verse 9, when someone was sick, they would go to the priest. The priest would look at the person and the priest would make an assessment and give an advice. When people are sick, let's say you are bridging of life faith, you're in the studies, you go to your group, and you see people coming up with strange ideas going off. You can talk to the group leader. Just as anciently, there was no doctor in Aaron's days you know, that they're going to say, let's call the doctor, let's take him to the hospital. It was the priests who had to deal with the sick. Because when the children was of Israel were in Egypt, as we said before, they didn't study medicine. Nobody went to medical school and nobody went to study nursing. Anything they understood, it was just natural medicine, herbs and things like this. So now, when some cases, herbs can cure. Leprosy is not like that. The priest had to intervene, God's servant. And so sometimes in the spiritual realm, when somebody is sick, you need the ministry, the tubes in Zechariah chapter four to come assess the situation. You call upon one of the ministry, the certified teachers to say, listen, something is up here and I don't understand all of this thing. You want to think you, you can explain this because this brother, this sister is saying so and so. So this is what Aaron used to do. Aaron's physical work was to assess the sick and see if they're fit to be in the congregation. The tubes, the seven tubes in Zechariah chapter four, they are the ones, the medium between the bowl and the church. So the church members get their oil from them. So the Lord has set up what's going on in the physical to show us all the spiritual works. Because deceivers are floating around everywhere. Here is seen that Satan is a great tempter for our souls, that he constantly seeks to make us fall, but he cannot do anything against us if our hearts be right with God. And if we stay within the edge, you see this? Word H E D G E. It's like you have a dog or a sheep and you put a fence, an edge. He has built around us. So mentally, you see that these people are sick, that are spiritually sick. God gives you a mental mask to put on. And he says, mark them on a board in your mind. You can know John is sick, false doctrines. And the Lord has further protected us by putting an edge that he has built around us. And so he can succeed only if we ourselves make it possible. So God has made an edge, you know, and only us who can take ourselves out of that position to make ourselves susceptible to be overcome. If we willingly yield to sin, we thus voluntarily surrender to Satan. Let us not forget that no one can keep on, keep on going his own way and at the same time pray the Lord's Prayer without making a liar of himself. 
lead us not into temptation. So if the Lord is not leading us into temptation, how could someone go off on their own and not make the Lord's prayer a lie? He's going to make himself a liar. But those who owe art to take the Lord at his word and allow him to direct their steps, they never go wrong. We should pray to become among this latter class that stays in the edge that he has built around us. The lesson, too, from Job's child will be for their learning, hope, and courage. They will know that it is to be either their life or their death, and to life they will cling. They will not be found among, they will not be found murmuring, doubting, accusing, despairing for whatever their lot while inside God's edge. While inside God's edge, they will know it is his will for them. You see, it is like you have a fence and you put the people inside the fence. And you say, mentally, protect your mind. Mark problem people. Write it on a board in your mind. Deceivers. And if you talk to them, reason with them, study with them to help them. If they can't be helped, you put them one side. Social distancing. But stay inside God's edge. And what's God's edge? If you, brethren, stay inside God's hedge of inspired revelation, where did God say he's going to feed his people from? Carmel, Bashan, and then finally Gilead. That's what inspiration has revealed. And walk with him as did Enoch of old. You will have him by your side every step of the way. So whatever you, so whatever. Your burden, leave it with him, and he himself will bear it for you in tr to triumph. Know that he has heard your prayer and that he will grant your requests as he sees fit to carry out his plan for you and for the, his gospel today. Miracle mongers, miracle hunters, fanatics, all bear in mind, may become dangerously subversive, ready to sabotage everything, that is not in accordance with their thinking. Social distance. Loose and rattling tongues will endeavor to shake the fate of us all. Social distancing. The ones, though, who bear the heaviest burden of feeding the flock with meat in due season will be the devil's main targets. At just such a time as this, these devoted followers of God will profit most by the Lord's advice. Trust in not a friend. And this is a friend. You can mark them by the way they're talking and behaving. Put in not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. Even people in the same house. For the son dishonored the father. The daughter riseth up against her mother. The daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And so, folks, put on your mask. Mark the wicked. Social distance against them. And stay in God's hedge. What he has set up to keep us safe. And inspiration says, Timely Greetings, Volume 2. Number 46, page 48 to 49. It will be discovered that there will be thousands of voices. As we have thousands of diseases upon the land, we have thousands of spiritual diseases. And listen, no two, two diseases the same, you know. But inspiration tells us we're going to have thousands. Some from professed believers, and some from those who fight against the fate of the saints. One voice condemning one thing, another condemning another thing. And what one condemns, another will approve. But when El closed to the light of God's word, all their discarding, philosophizing, and murmurings, their man-made plans, and carnal ideas will be seen to be but a tumult of envy, 
jealousy, pride, self-opinionation, hatred, malice, politics, greed, prejudice, and every other selfishness. And they're trying to infect you with these things. These unfortunate self-sent ones, being yet in spiritual darkness, doubtless imagine themselves to be working for God with zeal and energy. But one day, they will are finally discover that they have been working against the Lord, as Saul of Tarsus discovered about himself. May the prayers of the saints awaken them and put them working for the Lord, as the prayers of Stephen caused Saul to become the great apostle Paul for both Jew and Gentile. And may he that at an ear hear what the Spirit saith, and hold fast that which at least the enemy deceitfully take it from his grasp. So God is warning us. God is talking to us. And now there are thousands of false wood going around. And so while we are protecting ourselves from physical disease, you know, we better be fortified from the spiritual diseases. And so the edge that God has set up, having thus briefly recalled to your minds the fatal mistake of the church throughout her long history, I now divulge the climaxing news. Father has promised to give forever to mother. Pisgah's view, his great vineyard, is she will return and be true. He will edge it about with a wall of fire. This is his kingdom church, you know. Lay its stones with fair colors and its foundation is a fire. Make its windows a gates and its gates of carbuncle and deck all its borders of pleasant stone. This it, this it, it's that God edge about is his kingdom. He surrounds it with a wall of fire. And where does this protection start? Where does this protection start? Where does it start? This edge. We see it goes right into the kingdom. It says, provisional in setup as well as in name, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association exists solely to accomplish a divinely appointed work within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, wherein it therefore strictly confines its activity as its work therein draws to a close and the servants of our God are sealed, Revelation 7.3, are sealed, its name will be changed and its purpose and its work will become all embraced into the gospel. Then its constitution and bylaws as Aaron codify, will become fully operative. It's the same association you know, that goes all the way into the kingdom. And so the edge that God has around the association, the protective wall, you see the name Davidian, derived from the name of the king of ancient Israel, accrues to this association by reason of its following aspect. First, it. The it is the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association, is dedicated to the work of announcing and bringing forth the restoration as predicted in Hosea 1, verse 11, and chapter 3, verse 5, of David's kingdom in antitype, upon the throne of which Christ, the son of David is to sit. Second, it purports itself. So now the it is the association. And so when inspiration says here, he will edge it about with a wall of fire, he has to edge his association around with a wall of fire from its in its vanguard stage. And it goes straight on to the kingdom where now it is edge about with a wall of fire protection. And so when God is saying, stay inside the edge, because there will be a thousand voices, the Lord is saying, if you're in the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association, you have your mask on, you're fortified, feeding on the rod from the place he said you should be fed from, let them feed in Bashan 
you'll be protected. Because there are wolves and deceivers all over the place. Everywhere they are. And the association God has established to protect his people, to edge them in. It is the edge that the Lord has protected them with. This is where they get their fellowship certificate from. And so this is how now they can avo avoid being deceived because they can ask prospective teachers, show us your fellowship certificate. Show us. And inspiration says, we are called into the election of God. The scripture says, not because of any good works of our own, but through the grace of God. We are, therefore, invited to become Christians, the children of God, not because we deserve to be adopted by him, but because of his favor toward us. Indeed, there is no other way by which we can be saved. For we all have sinned, and therefore, how can we be saved except he, through his grace, Forgive us our sins and start us out anew. This is what is called a new birth. The sum of which is that we deserve no credit for coming into the household of God. The credit is is. This is where we come into the household of God, where he edge us around and we put on our spiritual mask and we write in our mind the deceivers that we see, and we can know how to social distance ourselves from the wicked. And so we have on our mass, we're edged about, we see the wicked, and we know to social distance ourselves from them. And the Lord says, it's the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association, the Vanguard Association, we're going to gather is people in the household of faith. And so the Dividend Seventh-day Adventist Association, we are told in the Leviticus page two, accomplish a divinely appointed work. So if it's accomplishing a divinely appointed work, the association is appointed to accomplish the work that was appointed to them. And the ministry must also be God's ministry. As Aaron anciently, Aaron was responsible for look to look upon the sick and determine if the people were clean or unclean. So the seven troops, the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association, the ministry, look upon those who are sick today and warn the flock. And those who are independent that are running up and down, that are saying, I am David and I am Elijah. And you must keep feast and Passover and Day of Atonement and New Moon. All these people are being exposed by the association. What does the reading instruct us to pray for? For an appreciation of, appreciation of God's love and for better understanding of him. For the right understanding of what it means to pray the Lord's Prayer. for wisdom, to know why we address God as our father, why we are members of one family, bridging of one household. So now you can discern when you see those who are not of the household. Because if you're in a house, you know those who are of the house. For grace to remember to pray not for ourselves only, but for our neighbors, and even for our enemies, that's what we're praying for, even for our enemies. And so the Lord wants us to do what we can do. And so not only here is pointed out that self-centered persons will never enter the kingdom of God. Only those who are endeavoring to do something for others, and especially for those who are of the household of faith. That is where God has edged us about will ever enter the joy of their Lord. No self-centered, self-sent will be edged about or will enter in the kingdom. And God's people must have on their mass and social distance sin spiritually. 
And the last reading says, as we have therefore opportunity, says Paul, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith, to them who hold a fellowship certificate. Those are who are of the household of faith, who are edged about, are the individuals who are striving to get their fellowship certificate, who belong to the household of faith. They're edged in, about in the association. No, the situation is very dynamic, the time that we live in. It is a very, very dangerous time that we come to. And anciently, shepherds, as a reading states, and I'm just going to abbreviate the reading, had dogs to help them and horses to carry food as they went out. And so if one sheep went missing, the shepherd would go and look for the sheep. They would go and search for those that wandered from the flock. And so as members of one family, the Lord has edged his people in. He has an association to keep his, say, his sheep safe. It is not safe for one to wander apart from the flock. That's what volume one, volume two of the Shepherd of Message state, page 81. It is not safe for them to wander away. Stay in the edge. And inspiration says there are thousands of voices as there are thousands of diseases. And this is why it's called the household of faith. And God is saying, now is the time where God's people need to start coming in. Because as physical diseases are multiplying upon the land, so spiritual sicknesses are multiplying. A lot of people are mentally ill and they're running off with all kinds of doctrine, looking people to infect with their sickness. And the one set of people the devil is more than interested in getting, he is interested, the flood is the same as water, which means people in the church, unconverted whom Satan is using to cause the church to be carried away in a very quiet manner so that no one would be suspicious of the great deception. In this way, he attempts to deceive the very elect, the 144,000, if possible. They are the ones he wants. They are the ones he wants more than anyone. And so we have to be guarded. And you have a flock of people and so when one wanders off, just as happened in the natural world, Satan can pick that one off easily. And this is why we're told we have to be sober, be vigilant, because our adversary, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And this is a time that we live in. It's deceptions are everywhere. And it becomes even more than that. Some have advanced the thought that as we near the close of time, every child of God will act independently of any religious organization. But I've been instructed by the Lord that, this, that in this work, there is no such thing as every man's being independent. In order that the Lord's work may advance healthfully and suddenly, his people must draw together. His people must draw together. And these are signs that people wear on them. This independent stuff going off, you can see. And I'm talking independent of truth. They've left the truth. And so inspiration is telling us. There's a certain element that, that even God can convince that he has taken the reins in his own hands. And if God can't do it, how am I going to do? Do it for the person. Are you? And inspiration says, spiritual blindness is a cruel thing. You know, somebody exercising cruelty, when Satan has gotten somebody in this position, inspiration says, it is a very cruel thing. Very cruel. And so, as it is in the physical, so it is in the spiritual. And so, inspiration says, physicians who would be successful in treating disease should know to minister, how to minister to a diseased mind. 
So it's when the doctors are performing surgeries or they're dealing with infectious disease, they put on their masks. When we're dealing with wicked people, we have no mass or covering over our mind. We take whatever doctrine, we read anything, and we sometimes know it's error, and we suck it up. We hear people gossiping people, talking all kind of bad things about people that they can't even prove, and we just sit and listen to it. We allow our mind to suck up all these things, and we protect ourselves from physical disease. Shouldn't be, folks. Shouldn't be. And you know what? This is called disease imagination. Sister C has a disease imagination. She has secluded herself from air until she cannot endure it without inconvenience. The heat in her room is very injurious to health. Her circulation is depressed. So you have a person that's sickly, depressed. She lives, she has lived in a hot air so much that she cannot endure the exposure of a ride out of doors without realizing a change. Her poor health is owing somewhat to exclusion of air and she has become so tender that she cannot have air without making her sick. If she continues to indulge this disease imagination, no, she's going to infect someone else. Now. She's depressed, she's sick, and when she talks to someone, she's always like this. She will be able to bear scarcely a breath of air. She ought to have the windows lowered in her room all through the day that there might be a circulation of air. God is not pleased with her for thus murdering herself. It is unnecessary. She has become thus sensitive to indulging a diseased mind. Air she needs, she must have. She is destroying not only her own vitality, but that of her husband and daughter and all who visit her. No. You see these sick people? You have to social distance yourself from them. And inspiration says this lady that was in this condition, if people went in her house to visit her, they're putting their lives in danger. And situations are worse now. There's all kind of immoral disease that abounds on the land. Adultery, fornication. I can't even, the amount of immoral sins, disease that has taken over the land. We can't name, as we have a lot of spiritual, depraved people, they're spiritually depraved too, with diseased minds. And as we have a lot of physical diseases upon the land, so we all have a lot of immoral disease, not only false doctrine and gossip, and all kinds of things. No. Moral disease abounds. This is mor moral enough. Morality. So when people are in have moral disease, they want to infect you, just like Mrs. Potiphar wanted to infect Joseph. If she had given him that moral disease, immoral disease, this is morality, you know. He would have sunk down low and lower till he was finished. Moral disease abounds and darkness covers the earth. But the disciples of Christ are represented as lights shining amid the gloom of light. Those rays reveal the dangers that lie in the sinner's path and point to the true way of to righteousness and safety. So no, moral disease abounds. Sister White, child guidance. She gives an example. Neighbors may permit their children to come to your house to spend the evening and the night with your children. Here is a trial and a choice for you. You have to decide. Sometimes they might say to your friends, the children can come over and spend time. You have the choice, the right. What kind of disease do these children have? Spiritual disease. You don't know. They're children. She says, it's your choice to run the risk of offending your neighbors by sending their children to their own home. So if you tell them that they can't do that, they might offend them. Or gratify them and let them lodge with your children and thus expose them to be instructed in that knowledge, which would be a lifelong curse to them. To save my children from becoming corrupted, 
I have not allowed them to sleep in the same bed or in the same room with other boys and have, as occasion as required, when traveling, made a scanty bed upon the floor for them rather than have them lodge with others. I have tried to keep them from associating with rough, rude boys and have presented inducements before them to make their employment at home cheerful and happy. By keeping their minds and hands occupied, they have had but little time or disposition to play in the street with other boys and obtain a street education. See what Sister White says? She does not allow her children to sleep on the same bed or in the same room with other boys. You know why? What kind of moral disease do these little other boys have? And they will infect her boy with that stuff that will be a curse for them as long as they live. She continues. My misfortune, which occurred when I was about nine years old, ruined my health. You know, a little, I got a girl, hit her in her face with a stone and she had bad health problem after that. I look upon this as a great calamity and murmured because of it. In a, in a few years, I viewed the matter differently. I then looked upon it in the light of a blessing. I regard it thus no. Because of the sickness, I was kept from society, which preserved me in blissful ignorance of the secret vices of the young. After I was a mother, by private deathbed, confession of some females who have completed the work of ruin, I first learned that such vices existed. So people are talking about confessing their sin open that they practice. And Sister White says she never knew people did those things. But I had no just conception of the extent of this vice and the injury, the health sustained by it until still later period. A young indulged to quite an extent in this vice before the age of puberty. And puberty is young, you know. Less than 14, people are pretty much active between 11 and 14. This is young girls without experiencing any very great degree, the evil result upon the constitution. But at this critical period, while merging into manhood and womanhood, nature makes them feel the violation of her laws. As mother sees her daughter languishing, dispirited, with very little vigor, easily irritated, starts suddenly and nervously when spoken to. So you see what he's saying? These people started out too young. They became active, both boys and girls. And they experienced manly stuff. They became irritated when spoken to, suddenly nervous. And she said, because they violated nature's law, they have no stamina and strength when they became men. And women, they became weak. She feels alarm and fears that her daughter will not be able to reach womanhood with a good constitution. They're sickly and weak because you know what? They started out too young. And they learned these things from their young children. So you know what? Sometimes they learn it from other children. Sister White said, she is not going to let None of them infect her children or boys with their spiritual disease. And she said she doesn't put them on the same bed nor in the same room because some of the children already corrupt. Moral corruption. And you have to teach your children too to put on their mask, social distance. And she said, She's not going to allow her children. She said, secret indulgences is in many cases the only real cause of the numerous complaints of the young. This vice is laying waste the vital forces. You know what is this? The vital forces, they have no strength. Even when they get married, they have no stamina. They're weak. They have to get a lot of tonic and feed the body to even try to recoup some of the strength the debilitating system until the habit which produced the result is broken off, there can be no permanent cure. 
To relieve the young from helpful labor is the worst possible cor curse, course a parent can pursue. Give, give them work to keep them occupied and not get into trouble. The life is then aimless and the mind and hands unoccupied, the imagination active and left free to in indulge in thoughts that are not pure and helpful. This gave them opportunity for more free indulgence in that vice, which is the foundation of all their complaints. And Sister White, in Testimony on Sexual Behavior, Adultery and Divorce, says the following. I know, oh God, regard these things. A married man, a minister of the gospel, leading the lambs of the flock into sodomitish practices. You see that? No. This moral disease that this minister has, you know what? When he infect these people with sodomitish practice, as long as these children live on planet Earth, they're tormented by the memory of that. And so you have adults that are having their eyes on the children. And Sister White says, and I quote from her, that was a quotation of the previous reading. You will continue this work of ruining souls. That's what their mind is filled with. Not only men, you know, but women too. You read it all the time in the news. These big adult teachers, even females, destroying the young people. They've taken away their usefulness. And so you have to put on the mental mass on your children too. You have to teach them the message. You have to warn them. So while we protect ourselves from physical disease, people who have spiritual disease, Sister White says she does not allow our children to sleep in other people's house like that. She said if she's traveling, she would rather sleep on a piece of cloth, put something on the floor and put them beside her on the floor than to send them to people's house to stay. She's not doing it because you have a lot of sick people. Their mind is depraved and sick. And you know what they're saying in their mind? I am terrible and dangerous inside. I will destroy if given the opportunity to do so. And Sister White was saying, even in the church, some people send their children off to camp and all this stuff. If you're not sending your children inside God's edge, know that these are God's people. You have to know what you're doing. This is why I know we are living in a serious, serious time. And she says, these are the very sins which corrupted Sodom. Their evil practice did not come all at once. First, one man and woman stupefied themselves by unholy, polluted habits. Then as, uh, the, uh, then as the uh, inhabitants settled in Sodom, they did as you are doing, educating others in a line that is forbidden of God. And so as the inhabitants continue to multiply, these ministers of sin continue in educating them in their own defiling practices until if any person came into their midst, their first thoughts, first, were to educate them in their evil work until Sodom became renowned for its pollution. So listen, you can have your child, you know. And as they see the child, the very first thought that comes to the mind is to pollute the child. So they plan it before even the act. We are living in a serious, serious time. And Sister White says there are thousands of deceptions. And so as the doctors in dealing with the sick cover themselves with masks to protect themselves from evil, when you send your child into a home to spend time with uncle or cousin or auntie, there can be a dangerous person in the house. They look nice. They talk nice. And listen. This is not only men, you know, because the woman that was choking Sister White Air was a woman. She says, to save my children from becoming corrupted, I have not allowed them to sleep in the same bed, 
are in the same room with other boys and have, as occasion as required, when traveling, made a scanty bed upon the floor for them to sleep rather than have them lodge with others. She said, listen, even if they had to sleep on the floor with her wherever, she is not going to take them and send to anybody's house because you know what? One night can change them for the rest of their life. And I just want to say here, if you were abused, it doesn't mean you should despair, you know. Don't despair. Thank God for what he has done for you. Jesus Christ was the most bullied, slandered, abused person. When I say abuse, I mean beaten, spot upon, slapped. But yet still, he left his life in God's hand. And this is why the Lord says he will give us a new body. He'll make all things new. This sickly abuse despised body that we have is going to make us a brand new creature. And so what we have to do who are God's people, we have to protect the flock, not only from false prophets, thieves and robbers and murderers, but sodomites, the same type of people that were sh stroking Sister White's ear. They're in the church. They're everywhere. They're all around. And this is what Sister White had to say about Mary Magdalene. Luke chapter 7. When Jesus Christ went to Simon's house, knowing the Pharisee which had bidden him, this is Christ, saw it. Mary Magdalene was crying and wiping Christ's feet with her hair. When Simon saw what she was doing, he spake within himself saying, this man, this is Jesus he's talking about. Jesus just healed him of leprosy. And he's saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what man of woman this is that touched him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him. Simon was saying this in his mind, you know. I know if we read Desire of Ages, Judas started off to infect Simon with the sin disease by saying, why wasn't this that sold and given to the poor? Why was not this perfume that Mary was using? And Simon got infected too and started to criticize Jesus, but he was doing it in his mind. But Judah spoke it openly. And so he caught a disease too, and he was cursing Jesus in his mind. This man, he was dressing the Savior as. And Christ has said to him, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, there was rightly judged. And Christ went on to tell him about the woman that came and she had sinned much and she was forgiven most. But this is what Sister White had to said on the matter because Simon had said, if this man was a prophet, he would have known what man of woman this is that touched him. How did he know what man of woman she was? How did he know her business, what she was, that she's a sinner? How did he know that? Did he know her? Sister White says, Simon, Simon was the one who led Mary into sin. He was her uncle. And that quotation is taken from the book, Daughters of God, page 61, paragraph one. Simon was Mary Magdalene's uncle. And he was the one who started her off in sin. So let's say Mary was a young girl, 10, 12, and her mother took her to go spend some time with her uncle. He was the one who led her out into sin. And so Jesus Christ, when you read Daughters of God, Jesus Christ didn't rebuke him openly, you know. Sister White says in Daughters of God, if Jesus Christ, Jesus could have spelled out his sin, but he rebuked him gently and saved Simon's soul. So the abuser was saved and the abused Mary Magdalene was also saved. And a lot of time it takes a lot of strength. 
Because when people are abused like Mary Magdalene, they just turn to prostitution. They feel like they have no self-worth. So folks, I am telling you, you have to have on your mask, not only on yourself, but you have to work to put them on your children. You can't just send your children to any and any place to go stay with people because we don't know what people have in their mind. Timely Greetings, volume two, number eight, page 24. Joel three, verse three. And they have so, and they have cast lots of my people and have given a boy. They have given a B-O-Y for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Inspiration says, verse three reveals the vile practices of the world. A boy, you know, a boy. And this is church people too. People who are supposed to be my people. And Sister White says she does not allow her boys to go in no bed with no other boys or to go in people's house and sleep like that. And all these boys that have been abused and nuns in convents. It is, it is a serious time that we live in. And so we want to give everyone hope. So it doesn't mean because people have been abused, they're worthless. That's what we're saying. We're saying, thank God that God has opened your eyes and brought you to him. And I've given you now the opportunity to be a shield and a source of protection for others because you have these wolves walking around in sheep clothing. False prophet, liars, gossipers, pedophiles, rapists, sodomites, all kinds of people put on your spiritual mask. Social distance yourself from these wicked viruses. And listen, we have to do this for ourselves. We have to do it for ourselves. And so all of us have to raise up as one people within the edge, within God's association, and ask God to help us to live the life, to finish the work, because the world is too wicked and spiritual disease is spreading. Physical disease is spreading and people are going down into hell daily. And what is sad, the pure, innocent young children that can't protect themselves. Let us rise up people and be converted that the Lord can bring this work to an end. And so another moral sin that is consuming us why we can't give ourselves to the Lord? You know what the Bible says? The rich rule it over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You know, like you're getting whip, you owe credit card debt, you owe car payment, mortgage, you owe this one food, money at the shop, you owe all kind of debt, you borrowed money and can't pay it back. That's some moral sin, you know. It's a yoke. Because the borrower is a servant to the lender. You borrow money from people, you see them calling you, you cannot answer the phone. And this is what inspiration says. The very highest kind of education that can be, could be given, not PhD, nor master's, nor bachelor's degree. The very highest education that could be given is to shun the incurring of debt as you would shun disease. So you know what? Your mask up and you're saying to yourself, I'm going to do my best to owe no man nothing. And you have on your mental shield. Live within your means. Give your life to the Lord. Come into the work. The Lord needs you. The children needs you. God needs you to rise up to defend the fatherless and the widow. And the fatherless children, while we're running up out there looking to just pay for car, we owe debts, and the Lord says, shun it. Social distancing. Don't owe debt. Keep it from you. Oh, no man, anything, Paul says in Romans 13, verse 11. 
Oh, no man, anything. The only thing you must owe people is love. Brethren, sisters, we're about to close. But I'm telling you, what is going on in the physical world is worse what is going on in the spiritual. And we're going to have to fight for our life. We're going to have to fight for our children. We're going to have to fight for our families. We're going to have to fight for our brothers and sisters in the faith. We're going to have to fight for our neighbors. And above all, we're going to have to have courage to act, to defend ourselves. And you know what? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Once you're in the edge, once the mind of God is in you, you can take off the spiritual mass because you are immune to any disease because the mind of Christ is now in us. We are protected from catching any disease and we don't need a mass anymore. We need a mass now because we're weak and sinning. Sin and repent, sin and repent. But it's time to rise up now in newness of mind and heart. And so the enemy made Laodiceans believe that they have no more, they have need no more truth, that they have all the truth that is necessary to get them through heaven's portals. Although God has declared that they are in need of everything that they're about to be spewed out. No, we, this is dividends, you know, really are in trust with, in, enriched with truth if we have studied and assimilated what has been given us. For we have had made available to us the gold that is tried in the fire, that we might be rich, the eye cells that we might see, and the raiment with which we might be clothed, Revelation 3, and the extra oil that our way might be lightened, Matthew 25. Therefore, the devil is not going to attack us where he attacked the Laodiceans, but he will tell us that we are poor in truth. False prophet will come and tell us we don't have enough. He will do this in almost any way. The testimonies I heard some give here last night show just that. Brothers and sisters, we have the last message. There's no other opportunity for us. The Lord has done everything to protect us. He has set up his edge, his association to keep us in. He has given us the message, what we are being fed with. He has told us to protect ourselves from spiritual wickedness by putting on our mass, our mental mass. And he has told us to be alert. God is doing all he can to save us. And if we are more mindful with what's going on in the physical and that's going on what, what is going on with the spiritual, we are going to lose our way. Brothers and sisters, we're closing, but we beseech you, make your calling and election sure. Let go the world and come into the work. The Lord needs us now. It is late. It is a late, late hour. The devil knows that this last message the world will ever receive. We have it. This is it. Hence, the red highlighted section ends because we cannot be too cautious of his snares. Folks, protect yourself. Come into his edge. Do some work for the Lord now. If the men in the world and women can protect themselves from physical disease, how much more us have to protect ourselves from false prophets, liars, murderers, gossipers, rapists, and all the other type of people. God has set up his association to guide our feet and may God help us to make our calling and election sure. And may we make it home. The rod is here. The rod is here. The last message and the last messenger came to help us being the last born by antitypical Elijah V.T. Houty. Let us fortify ourselves and let us stay true faithful, clean, and clear, knowing that the Lord is bringing us into a virus-free environment. He's bringing in his vanguard where children can play just like they're playing the kingdom. 
is the same people going over there and they have to be clean from here. So brother, brothers and sisters, I'm begging you, please, it is time for us to rise up and get our act together. Let us pray. Father in heaven, bless us and keep us and help us to fortify ourselves in this wicked time that we're living. And we ask for your mercy and we ask you to bless your association, bless your people, bless your work and have mercy on the little children and help us, your people, to know that it's our sins that is keeping this world going. And if we just rise up and put our sins and wickedness and walk with you as Enoch as of old, how soon this world could wrap up. Have mercy, we beg. Through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all and take care.